Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luncheon with the Experts, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host this week and every week, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and a writer, among a few other things, uh, that's been working with CCF with the foundation for over 10 years. And in that time, we have created countless videos, uh, hundreds, I would probably say, um, live video series like you're, the one you're going to watch today patient-centric documentaries, treatment-based videos, conference and event videos, all kinds of videos, but all with the same mission in mind, and that is to spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do. Now, first of all, if you're new to this community, if you're new to this show, I want to, first of all, say welcome, and secondly, say embrace this community that, that we've cultivated here on the show. You can probably see people already chiming in on the comments and telling us where they're from. I encourage you to do the same thing. This community is so strong, is so supportive. Engage with them, embrace them. They will embrace you back and they will help you. I think the value of this show is really twofold. One, the information you're going to get from our guest today and two, the community, the shared experiences, the shared stories from other people within this community. So make sure that you reach out to them. Uh, you can see the folks saying hello from all over the world. Nepal, Alabama, San Jose, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Go ahead and say hello, folks. We're going to get the show going. Before we do, we always want to thank our sponsor, Ibsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do the show. And we always have this disclaimer from them before we start, and that is that the opinions expressed by the guest today, as well as the questions asked by the audience that you all at home, haven't been created or suggested by the sponsors of Lunch and the Experts, and CCF doesn't endorse or promote uh, any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation today. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guests and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. Okay, so as disclaimers often are, that's a lot of words, but really the takeaway there is that final statement. We don't know your specific case most likely, or our guest doesn't, and so we're going to give you some great general advice. We're going to hopefully answer some of your questions, but take that advice and those answers to your question back to your home team, which does know your specific case and make the best plan and path forward for you. Now, folks, today I'm very, very excited about this show, uh, the upcoming show, and I think that you should be as well. This is a first time guest, but uh, as we were talking and I was getting to know her a little bit more um, she is very versatile, very well-rounded, has a lot of extensive knowledge about the topic of many topics in the net space. So you're in for a treat today. Today, we are having Dr. Simona Glassberg on the show. How are you, Dr. Glassberg? I'm very excited and grateful for the kind invitation to join you today and uh, to talk with you, uh, your patients and try to help. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for being here. Now, uh, tell for those who may not know you and where you work, what you do, what, what exactly, what role do you fill? What roles do you fill in, in this net community that we're talking about? Yeah, so um, I work in Jerusalem. Uh, I'm an endocrinologist training in internal medicine uh, initially, but then in endocrinology and then in neuroendocrine tumors. Um, I am the head of the uh, INET Center of uh, Excellence at Hadassah Hebrew University Medical Center in Jerusalem, um, uh, running a multidisciplinary team uh, to treat and diagnose patients with neuroendocrine tumors. We do in our center a lot of research, uh, both clinical research, but also basic research. And I'm also an associate professor of medicine at the um, Faculty of Medicine of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So I think this is our, our might be our first time uh, hosting someone from your part of the world. But folks, um, we, there's a lot of different topics that we'll be able to ask questions about today. We're going to get into some of that. But before we do, I want to talk a little bit about the show, if you're unfamiliar with the format. Uh, one thing I want to draw attention to first, I noticed, uh, Nancy, that you figured it out, but you had mentioned there is no sound. Here's another little tip that I haven't mentioned in a while. At the bottom of your screen, there's the option to have closed captions or the subtitles going during the show. And sometimes that helps if you know, if you're at work and watching the show and you can't have the sound on or if you're having trouble with your sound, the subtitles helps a little bit. There's a little icon that says CC for closed caption kind of by your volume uh, and the and the icon to make it full screen. 
anyway, that's just a little tip that helps you if uh, if um, the audio is off on your program. Okay, so go ahead and start sending in your questions. We're going to do our best to get to all of them. Dr. Glassberg has told me that nothing is off limits. You can ask her all the questions. She has a very uh, wide array of knowledge uh, in the net space. We're going to try our best to get to all of them, but we, we may not. In fact, we probably won't because we get so many questions that inevitably we can't get to them now that's a kind of a good problem because it allows us to keep the show going on every week but a couple of tips that will help uh, get your question answered that you could do for me sometimes people as i mentioned already we can't be very case specific we don't know your specific case so sometimes people try to include lots of nuanced information about their case that they think will be helpful for the question but it's actually too much it's too dense and so try to formulate your questions in very generic terms like hey i'm experiencing this uh you know what should i look for who should i talk to what should i consider etc cetera, etc cetera. and i know you'll have follow-up questions and that's quite all right and then so just chime in after that once you get a question answer with your your other question instead of trying to jam pack four or five questions in the same paragraph just makes it a little bit easier think about little small generic chunks um and if you still have follow up questions after the show i encourage you to reach out to carcinoid cancer foundation either here on the facebook page you can message them this is their website right behind me carcinoid.org you can visit them there and the video as soon as we're done recording today the video will be posted on the Facebook page, it will stay there under the videos tab starting next week, early next week, we will republish it to YouTube for anyone who doesn't have Facebook. If there's someone uh, that you think should be here for this show, go ahead and tag them in the comments, remind them the show is going on. We want to get as many people here as possible. And also the last thing that I ask you all, you do a very good job every week, is if you see a question in the sidebar that you also have, or you're interested in the answer to, you can like it, love it, any of the emotions that Facebook lets you use, they all work the same way for me. And that's to effectively upvote that question. If I see eight people have the same question, I'm going to make sure to ask that one, okay? So that just helps me do my job better, which is, of course, to serve you. So go ahead and start sending in your questions. Uh, I have the first question. That's my you know, my right as, a, as the host <laughs> to get the show started. Something interesting that uh, Dr. Glassberg mentioned right before we started recording. Dr. Glassberg, you were telling me about this ebook that you that you just wrote. I want to learn a little bit more about the work you do with uh, men nets or, or the Middle East nets. But the ebook, I think, is so valuable. Tell me a little bit about that. I don't want to talk about it, uh, but I'm excited to hear about it. Tell me about that project. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question and for uh, raising it. Um, I mean, we feel in our daily um, uh, life that uh, patients with neuroendocrine tumors need more um, help regarding the nutrition. Um, and um, last year, uh, practically, um, the head of the advocacy group in Israel, which is called uh, MENETS, or Middle East Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, uh, namely uh, Mike Rosenberg, together mm -hmm. with the society and together with uh, cooperation with uh, nutritionists, uh, both from Israel, but also from, from England, um, uh, they uh, put together a book which is addressing um, most of the aspects related to neuroendocrine tumors uh, in terms of the disease itself, uh, in terms of uh, adverse uh, um, um, event related to different treatments and nutrition. Uh, and this book is available online electronically on the uh, website of Menetz, uh, and it is translated uh, in English, Arabian. It's of course available in Hebrew, um, Romanian, uh, and Russian. Um, and I uh, suggest really uh, to uh, go to the website of Menetz and look uh, for this book, which is uh, free, and it can be really very useful. Folks, uh, incredible offer. I know just from hosting the show that every week you have questions about nutrition. So I think this is crucial. And just to reiterate, we'll try to put the link in the uh, in the comments, but that's menets, M-E-N-E-T-S dot org. And it's a free resource for you. Uh, that's a question that a lot of times our specialist um, don't don't have a lot of knowledge about or don't really speak to that too much, but we still get questions about nutrition all the time. We've created videos about nutrition. I know it's uh, important to you all, so I was very excited for Dr. Glassberg to, to talk to us about that. It's such a great resource. Um, okay, Dr. Glassberg, we have lots of questions rolling in already, so I'm going to go ahead and start uh, start taking some from the 
from the audience. First question comes from Dwayne. It says, please explain pancreatic polypeptide and its relation to PNETs. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. So thank you, Dwayne, for this uh, uh, question. Pancreatic polypeptide is one of the hormones that can be uh, secreted um, uh, by neuroendocrine tumors in the pancreas. And it uh, helps us practically to mainly follow up um, uh, the disease. It is not always uh, increased, so it's not the only tool um, for follow-up, but it can help us uh, together with other uh, tests like imaging, uh, the clinical presentation, and other uh, biochemical tests to follow um, and uh, uh, to see how the disease is uh, responding, for example, to a specific treatment, what is the status of the disease, if the disease is stable or progressive, uh, but it is not always increased, uh, and when it is increased, it can help. Got it. Thank you so much, and thanks for your question, Dwayne. From Jim, a common question, but many advances seem to begin from European sources. Can you comment on the alpha PRT trials? We also get a lot of questions about this. Yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, alpha PRT trials, they are um, ongoing and practically they offer us a new venue of treatment in terms of uh, um, PRT. Um, I mean, I hope that we'll have uh, uh, more knowledge about the alpha emitter um, molecules and PRT in the nearby future, and it can be uh, another option of treatment and not only the um, regular uh, lutetium dotatate. Um, so I, I really hope that uh, we'll have more answers in the future. I know that uh, these trials are ongoing um, and um, hopefully will be, uh, the treatment will be available not only in the States, but uh, worldwide. Yeah, I know a lot of people are interested in, in this topic for sure right now. So we'll, we'll continue to, to... I have to mention uh, in Israel at Hadassah practically, we started with PRT. Uh, we were the first ones in 2011. Um, wow. And uh, with a lot of experience with lutetium dotatate with lutatira. Um, and uh, right now we are really uh, feeling the same as, as our patient that we need more options re regarding PRT, not only the uh, lutetium dotatate, uh, because uh, the patients are so heterogeneous with so yeah. heterogeneous uh, uptake uh, and the expression of somatostatin receptors and so on. And uh, so we are really looking forward as you do. Um, yeah. This uh, treatment, yeah. And 2011, that's impressive, uh, folks. For a little context, we in the states we didn't start using it until 2018, right? The beginning of 2018. So, uh, Jim's point is is valid there about uh, European sources. Um, next question from Jennifer about lung nets. Do you see lung nets return if if no spread at the time of surgery? Do you generally see them uh, return? Um. It's a, it's a tough question. I uh, mean, of course. Uh, lung neuroendocrine tumors um, need patients with lung neuroendocrine tumors need to be followed up for life. Even if the disease was completely excised, we know that also uh, even the patients that have typical carcinoid, I mean, the uh, lung uh, neuroendocrine tumors with the uh, best characteristics of the disease um, can return after many years. Um, so these patients really need uh, to be followed by um, specialists and to repeat from time to time also a uh, whole body uh, imaging like uh, gallium dotatate, PET CT, so on, because I see from time to time patients that were diagnosed like a decade ago, and they are coming back uh, because either symptoms of carcinoid syndrome suddenly or um, they are uh, hearing about us and they come for follow-up and we are performing up for the many years, gallium dotatate PET CT, and we find actually uh, skeletal bone metastasis, for example, which uh, could not be seen if the patient will perform only CT, for example, of the chest. So um, these tumors really need to be followed by people that understand the biology of the tumor um, unfortunately, uh, still we see from time to time 
uh, patients that uh, underwent only surgery, they are um, diagnosed with so-called typical, uh, very good prognostication um, lung carcinoid, and then they are discharged from follow-up by the surgeon, for example, okay? So you really uh, have to know that the most important thing is to uh, find a net specialist with expertise in your disease in lung neuroendocrine tumors and to understand that uh, practically um, the follow-up should be continued for life. Of course, not every six months to perform imaging for your uh, um, whole life, but from time to time you have to perform uh, different tests to see that the disease is gone and not uh, present actually. God, thank you. And thank you, Jennifer, for your question. Folks, if you just joined us or joined us a little bit late, this is Luncheon with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program. We're here today with Dr. Simona Glassberg. And I wanted to make a point uh, piggybacking off of that question and that answer. I had mentioned at the beginning of the program, all the videos that I've worked on uh, with CCF on over the past 10 years. Uh, one, we have a documentary series currently uh, going on. We have a new episode. We have one episode released uh, that is up on the page and one is coming out at the end of this month. Each month we'll release it. But we've been getting a lot of questions. It seems to be more recently about lung net specifically. And we have covered almost every topic you can think of over the past 10 years in some form or fashion. But because we've been getting so many questions lately about it, I reposted one of our videos about lung nets and dip neck just the other day, just earlier this week. So at the begin, you know, a couple posts back on our Facebook page. If you want to see that after the show, check that out. I know we have always have lots of questions about lung nets. So moving on, our next question comes from John. Can abdominal surgical scar tissue contribute to bowel blockages? Yes, of course. Unfortunately, John, thank you for this uh, question. Many times, uh, patients of mine that are uh, going through abdominal surgery from different reasons related to neuroendocrine tumors are coming back to my clinic and uh, during uh, our meetings, they are complaining of gases, bloating, um, sometimes nausea, uh, sometimes diarrhea. Um, without any carcinoid syndrome, for example. So uh, it is really um, good to uh, remember and to keep in our minds that uh, the scar that you see on your abdomen, abdomen, uh, it is also inside your abdomen. And many times this uh, fibrotic tissue is practically narrowing uh, the passage of the gas of the stool um, in your intestine. Uh, and um, this is why uh, it can induce uh, obstruction and blockage. Uh, so it's really important if you have this kind of symptoms and uh, um, uh, you um, receive different treatments that can also influence like somatostatin analogs, it's important to raise these uh, um, um, symptoms while you are uh, discussing with your uh, um, a care provider with your physician, because there are some options that we can use, like uh, changing uh, the nutrition, uh, preventing uh, you know uh, foods that can increase the risk of blockage and obstruction. Uh, sometimes uh, um, adding uh, enzymes like pancreatic enzymes or um, uh, biliary enzymes and so on. So it's really uh, it can be uh, produced by the scar. And it should be discussed with your uh, um, physician. Got it. Thank you. Next question question comes from Bess. Bess says, do cutaneous net METs metastases progress at a different rate than METs in other areas? And follow up, uh, how are cutaneous METs treated? So cutaneous METs are, um, we've seen from time to time in people from my experience with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or lung neuroendocrine tumors or tiny neuroendocrine tumors, for example. Um, sometimes they grow in a different rate. Sometimes they are uh, growing in parallel with the uh, other sides of the disease. Um, and the treatment actually, it depends. I mean, if the patient uh, is getting a systemic treatment that is uh, going to all sides of the disease, so it's getting also to the uh, subcutaneous metastasis, sometimes from my experience, we can uh, excise specifically uh, specific metastas metastasis that is growing um, as only site of growing 
of the disease if all the other sites are uh, stable. Sometimes you can irradiate this uh, subcutaneous metastasis if they are painful, for example. I had a couple of uh, patients like this. So it is heterogeneous, it's complex, but uh, we can specifically address based of the, on the characteristics of the disease. Got it. Thanks, Beth, for your question. I know a couple other people were interested in that as well. Next question from Wendy, our friend Wendy. Hi. Uh, P-nets with liver metastases already whippled and resected. And she saw her oncologist last week. And the oncologist said, come back in six months. But Sunday, she fainted and was taken to the ER. And they didn't really know what to do with her. And so she she's still a little confused and a little weak. And right now, she's really unsure of what doctor to go see next. So I know that's kind of broad and kind of vague, but any any advice, any thoughts for Wendy? So thank you, Wendy, and I hope that you are, will get better soon. Um, as far as I understand, uh, you have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors with liver metastasis. You underwent weaker excision of the primary tumor, but still you have disease inside your liver, if uh, I'm not wrong. I believe so, yeah. So, um, so it depends. Fainting is a very um, not specific symptom. I mean, it can yeah. be related either, for example, if your pancreatic lesion uh, would uh, hypersecrete insulin, if it's an insulinoma, you can faint because of hypoglycemia. And uh, maybe after the operation, you are not eating uh, and drinking enough and you are kind of dehydrated. So maybe you should more uh, rest and uh, drink more and uh, see that your blood pressure is not too low and uh, so on. Um, but I think that the first, uh, usually from my experience, when this is happening to my patients, so uh, they can drop me an email and they, I can uh, um, um, recommend them what to do. If uh, you feel really bad, you should perform some blood tests to see that you are electrolytes. Uh, are fine uh, and um, uh, to consult either with your GP first of all, to perform some biochemistry, uh, blood glucose, uh, sodium, potassium, uh, 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 blood count to see that your hemoglobin is okay after the operation, that you are not having a bleeding, for example. And so uh, what I would suggest to you, it's uh, in parallel to uh, see your GP uh, and uh, drop an email or call your uh, net specialist too. And if this is not uh, really available, you can go, of course, uh, to the emergency room of your nearby hospital. Maybe you need to receive some uh, uh, fluid uh, infusion and so on. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, Wendy, I hope that helps sending you all the love. Uh, let us know if you have any other questions. We're here for you. Uh, from Mel. Will PRRT help with metastasis to the bones? I have stage four with bone mets, but no one has talked about treatment for that. Oh, so this is, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, um, PRRT, it is an option for bone metastasis. It depends on the number of uh, the metastasis. If you have, for example, single or um, very limited number of uh, metastasis, maybe, and if they are stable, and asymptomatic without, without pain, for example. So um, you can uh, go on. I don't know if you are receiving somatostatin analog, the usual one, for example, but you can continue on it. You can ask your um, a med specialist on receiving, for example, um, treatment specifically for the bone metastasis like vitamin D, calcium, uh, and bisphosphonate or the nozomab if needed. In general, uh, trying to address the question regarding PRRT and skeletal metastasis, if there is a um, wide spread uh, to the bones and there is a high expression uh, of somatostatin receptors shown by uh, increased uptake on gallium dotatate PET CT, in principle, of course, you can receive PRRT, uh, which should help also your bone metastasis. But it's you know, the decision, it's uh, complex uh, and you should, uh, uh, it, one should consider also the blood count. Uh, if there is a, a huge skeletal involvement, sometimes uh, uh, the bone marrow is affected and the blood counts can be low. So uh, it depends, but in, in principle, yes, PRRT can be an option for um, metastatic disease to the bones. 
Thank you. And thank you too, Mel, for your question. Um, from Kayla, this, mm, this um, may be a nutrition thing, but the, the question is what causes yellow stools uh, for context is five years post-surgery with liver mets. Any so, thoughts on that? It depends. I mean, uh, it can be um, uh, steatorrhea if you have a high content of fat on, in your stools. And uh, then the stools are more foamy and uh, um, not well organized. Um, uh, it can be um, because of uh, um, loss of or enough amount of uh, uh, biliary um, enzymes. Um, but you should ask your net specialist about it and maybe get some uh, supplements of these uh, things that I've just mentioned. Okay. Uh, thanks for your question, Kayla. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, I know there's a few things that you were uh, asking about uh, earlier. From Karen, is it common to get more lesions in your liver once you have had a liver biopsy? No, I mean, the, the question, if I understand well, is if uh, one performs a liver biopsy, it can increase the number of metastases spread. Uh, usually there is a, a quote saying that the metastasis does not um, produce another metastasis. I mean, the, the short uh, answer is no. Okay. Okay. The, the long answer is uh, in, we are using liver biopsies many times uh, for uh, grading the tumor, for uh, um, re-evaluating the tumor when um, some of the lesions are behaving different one from the other one. Um, but uh, um, there is no spread uh, of the disease usually that is meaningful mm -hmm. uh, for the disease treatment. Got it. Thank you. Um, from Robin, if a net mass grows after surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation in a short amount of time, would you explain why there might be res any resistance to the usual cytotoxins and debulking tumors? It seems like she's been getting some, some resistance to that. Yeah, I understand. And I, I, I would like to be ca very careful in my answer because this is, you know, a tough question and, sure. and uh, uh, without knowing uh, any of uh, the details of the treatment of disease characteristics and so on. But if, uh, if a tumor is growing fast after all this line of treatments that were mentioned, um, this implies actually that the tumor is more aggressive. Um, and uh, practically we can consider to re-biopsy and maybe to do a, a molecular analysis to see if there are any uh, genes uh, um, expressed or overexpressed or mutated so on to look for some um, uh, maybe um, options of treatment that are experimental. But of course, this is just you know, uh, very, very general yeah, uh, yeah. Um, kind of saying not. Uh, totally, not yeah. Very particular, yeah. Yep, understood. Thanks, Robin. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions, though, okay, if you're still on the call. Folks, we are about halfway done, so we have plenty of time for questions. Keep sending them in. And uh, again, I'll reiterate, if you have follow-up questions and we're still on the call, continue to ask them. But um, even after the show, feel free to reach out to CCF to get those questions answered. And we're going to do our best to, to do that for you. That's our job. From Jennifer, any test you recommend if scans are clear, uh, but you had a lung net removed four months ago and now you're having gut issues? Any, any, any tests uh, that you recommend? Uh, so usually uh, what is recommended uh, for follow-up is the level of chromogranin in the blood. Uh, and uh, uh, urinary collection 24 hours for uh, 5-HIA, which is the uh, metabolite of serotonin, uh, which we are using uh, in these uh, tumors because lung carcinoid are one of the tumors that can hypersecrete serotonin and induce carcinoid syndrome uh, with uh, diarrhea or loose stools, for example. Another test that we are using in Israel, and uh, I'm not sure how um, widely available it is in, uh, in the United States, we are trying to make it more available here, is ProGRP. Uh, we are just uh, sharing now uh, our experience 
uh, with progrp compared with promogranin a for example because in lung neuroendocrine tumors we know that in the presence of the disease in about 40 percent of patients the chromogranin a can be inappropriately normal so in this subgroup of patients with present disease but with inappropriately normal marker of the disease, the chromogranin A, we need more markers. So this is why we are using the ProGRP. There is some uh, experience in the literature that uh, was reported uh, in the past, like more um, very short series of patients or uh, case reports. And we are trying now, uh, we are in uh, a process of uh, publishing our experience in a couple of uh, um, um, in about uh, 50 patients that comparing also with chromogranin A, and it's very meaningful. I mean, we see patients in whom the chromogranin A is, is inappropriately normal, the progrp is elevated, and this induces us to, uh, to do more tests in order to see where the disease uh, uh, recurred and so on. So I hope that I answer the question. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Appreciate appreciate all your questions. The next one comes from Florian, our friend from Germany. Is the biopsy for a lung nodule done with a bronchoscopy? It depends where the nodule is localized. I mean, if the nodule is uh, close to the uh, bronchus, for example, or intrabronchial, mm -hmm. so it can be a uh, biopsy uh, during the bronchoscopy. But if it's a more... Um, um, uh, far away from the uh, respiratory tract, so uh, the nodule can be biopsied under the guidance of a CT, for example, but not using bronchoscopy. It depends where the nodule is localized inside the chest. Got it. Thank you. All right. Next question comes from Eileen. Eileen says, uh, I was just diagnosed with uh, PNETs in the pancreas, seven millimeters and low KI-67. Uh, sorry to hear that, Eileen, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, and Eileen's question is, what is the next uh, assessment? Is it an imaging workup? Okay, so thank you, Eileen, for this question. It's actually, um, as we perform more tests from different, for different reasons, we find more what is called incidental pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and in uh, this case, practically, um, the decision on... Uh, and the uh, approach is based on the size of the tumor, if the tumor is less or more than two centimeters. If the tumor is uh, grade one, you said that uh, the P67 is low. The question is how low, if it's less than 3% or more than 3%, because less than 3% is uh, grade one, so it can be followed in principle. And we are checking if the uh, tumor is uh, um, secreting or hypersecreting uh, any hormones in terms of gastric, insulin, and uh, so on. Um, if the tumor is only seven millimeter, um, grade one, non-functional, uh, in principle, in general, we can consider just to follow up because the, the risk of uh, spread or growing of the tumor and its spread is less than 6% lifetime. However, this is very general, so yeah, you should, you know, uh, um, consult with your uh, net specialist. We are doing also uh, in peanuts uh, when they are diagnosed a gallium dot at eight bed CT, for example. But at seven millimeter um, diameter of the lesion, there is a very high probability that you will not see on the PET CT because of the small size of the lesion. Usually. Uh, to see these lesions um, um, PET on somatostatin receptor imaging, um, the lesion should be at least eight millimeter and with, uh, with a very high expression of somatostatin receptor. So it depends uh, on the size of the tumor. Got it. Hey, thank you, Eileen. I appreciate you being here and your question. Uh, speaking of functional and non-functional, uh, Kate says, can you go from functional to non-functional after being on Lanreotide? From non-functional to functional or from functional? To from functional to non-functional is the question. So uh, the, the treatment with octreotide practically will not change the disease uh, behavior, the, the biological behavior of the disease. I mean, the octreotide cannot change the um, uh, biology of a tumor from 
functional to non-functional, but it can help, of course, to decrease the uh, hormonal levels which are hypersecreted. So per definition, this is a kind of a, a little bit misleading question, but I, I, I believe that uh, the question was if, uh, if octreotide can help and the, uh, the hormonal hypersecretion and then uh, improving clinically and then practically becoming behaving clinically non-functioning from functioning. Hope that I answered the question. Got it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, and listen, Kate, if 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 that wasn't exactly right in terms of your question, of course, just let us know. We have plenty of time, about 25 minutes left. From Sarah, friend of the foundation here almost every week, I think. Have you seen metastatic neuroendocrine tumors on the skin? I am well differentiated, liver, bone, skin, KI-25, and the skin tumors are the same. Yes. As mentioned before, I've seen uh, from time to time patients with uh, skin or subcutaneous uh, metastasis from a neuroendocrine tumor, usually uh, from pancreatic or lung or thymic neuroendocrine tumor uh, origin. Um, you have, uh, as far as I understand, the well-differentiated grade three tumor. Uh, and if the um, um, subcutaneous metastases are stable and they are not uh, producing any symptoms, so uh, they, will they are receiving the systemic treatment as the all other sides of the disease. So you don't need specifically to address them um, except the situation if uh, only these metastases are growing, for example, or they are painful and then you can excise and irradiate that, uh, that side of the disease, for example. Got it. Thank you, Sarah. Always good to see your, your name uh, here at the show. From, <clears throat> from Nodi, can you still have bland embolization or ablation for tumors larger than five centimeters since chemo is not either shrinking them or keeping them stable? Yeah, so usually, um, thank you for the question. Usually, uh, rather frequency ablation um, is limited by the size of the tumors. I mean, in general, up to about three centimeters, um, it's as far as I know from our um, invasive radiology specialists, they do not like to um, ablate uh, lesions that are larger than three centimeters, for example, because uh, the risk of uh, residual disease is very high then. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, local regional treatments, either chemoembolization or blind embolization of, or even CIRT, uh, I mean, it is always considered, we are always considering this, but we are discussing these patients with, again, the invasive radiologist uh, specialist and decide the case by case. But the, the, the answer is yes, it can be considered. Uh, usually if it's decided to do a um, chemoembolization, for example, or bland embolization, um, in Israel, at least in our center, we plan usually two um, treatments like this, but many times if there is a large burden of the disease in the, in the liver, uh, sometimes we need to, to uh, repeat this embolization for more than two times, for example. Got it, thank you. Um, next question from Karen, what is the best imagery to see the sizes of tumors? It depends again. So uh, we have anatomical imaging and we have uh, functional imaging. So in terms of seeing the best, uh, the size of the tumor, usually we need an anatomical modality uh, or either high resolution CT or an MRI. For example, for the liver, we use a multi enhanced MRI, which is uh, uh, very um, detailed and helps very much. Sometimes depends which area you want to see uh, better. Uh, for liver, uh, multi-enhanced uh, MRI for uh, pancreas and uh, pancreatic duct, uh, et cetera, and MRI, MRCP, for example, and so on. But usually for the size of the lesion, you need an anatomical modality, which is complementary, uh, and the, the functional modality is complementary. Functional meaning PET CT. Got it. Thank you. Sometimes we also use 
ultrasound, for example, if uh, the patient is very uh, skinny, you know, and uh, we want to see um, a, a liver metastasis, for example, it can be uh, evaluated by ultrasound. Uh, there are patients that the ultrasound might be better than the MRI for the liver, but it's really very uh, personal. I mean, it depends on the yeah. case. Next question from Marilyn. Marilyn. Marilyn, I think that might be the first time I've seen your name. If you're new to the show, welcome. Appreciate you being here. Question is, if someone is 10 years clear after Merck cell on her arm, can she relax about it? Common question. <laughs> Tough question. Thank you, Mary. Tough question. Uh, yeah. Uh, Merkel cell uh, is one of a kind. I mean, usually when we diagnose the Merkel cell carcinoma, I'm referring the patient to an oncologist. It's um, uh, not. It's it has neuroendocrine uh, features, but it's more um, oncological uh, disease. Um, and I think it depends very much on the disease characteristics at the beginning. And it's very hard to answer to you. And mm. it's, I cannot say that, yes, after 10 years, uh, you're free of disease. I, we have to be very cautious. And um, I think it's hard to answer. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, well, thanks for your question, Marilyn. Uh, appreciate you being here. Next question from, this is from Sharon. We may need some more context for this uh, about the source of the chronic cough, but the question is, because a few other people have this, what is good to take for chronic cough? Nothing seems to work. Oh, chronic cough is very general question. Of course. I, yeah. I, I believe that maybe you ask uh, in uh, in the presence of a lung carcinoid. Or That's maybe, what I would assume. Or, but or maybe in the presence of deep neck. So if you have a lung carcinoid and you are coughing a lot, you should ask also for the uh, possibility uh, maybe that uh, you have deep neck because uh, deep neck, it, you, from, for those of you that maybe are not uh, um, familiar with this uh, entity, is the presence of um, bilateral in both lungs, um, lung, small or um, not so small um, areas of, uh, of carcinoid, uh, okay? That can be from millimeter to centimeter. And this entity practically is very many times uh, associated with uh, asthma. Um, so maybe uh, in context of a woman that is uh, more than about 50 years old uh, with lung neuroendocrine tumors and is coughing a lot, I think that I will suggest to um, uh, consult with your uh, pulmonologist and to um, try to do some tests uh, regarding asthma, respiratory function tests, and so on, and maybe some inhalers, and uh, this kind of uh, drugs can help. Uh, in my experience, and we published this with uh, John Strasberg from uh, Tampa, one of your uh, best known uh, specialists, very good uh, friend of mine. We published our uh, common experience with deep neck and somatostatin analogs that can improve coughing. Okay, so we have patients with lung carcinoid uh, that are coughing, they are taking inhalers and anti coughing the regular um, drugs uh, without improvement. And then uh, starting them on somatostatin analogs can help also against coughing. So this can be also um, discussed. Got it. Thank you. I uh, got a comment more from, from Leslie. This is just to the show in general. Uh, forgotten that it starts at 11 o'clock. I'm a little bit late. What's the topic today? Hey, Leslie, so with Lunch with the Experts, it's really not topic-based. It's specialist-based. Um, so sometimes it's very specific in terms of that uh, expert's specialty. But today we're talking about all kinds of things because our specialist uh, has a lot of knowledge about this, this disease. We've been talking a lot about lung nets, as it were. Uh, but really, if you have any questions, Leslie, that you're struggling with to get answered, Go ahead and send them in. We've got about 15 minutes left, so we'll try to get to it. Thanks for being here. From Fred, you know, back to the point about lung nets again. Uh, can a biopsy of a lung net in the middle lobe use a robotic bronchoscope procedure uh, or using a robotic bronchoscope procedure lead to a possible, possible metastasis within the lung? No. Uh, using a robotic uh, approach will not... Uh in principle, uh, increase the metastatic spread. But 
uh, it should be very uh, careful discuss this option of uh, of uh, surgery because lung net um, uh, when you operated uh, on this kind of uh, disease, always you should discuss excision of the uh, hilum lymph nodes. So uh, I'm not sure that uh, with robotic uh, approach it can be done. So mm -hmm. uh, usually we are less preferring robotic yeah. approach um, exactly because of this reason that the surgery, surgery should be an oncological surgery, not only to excise robotically the primary lesion, but also to look actively for the lymph nodes um, and to excise them. But uh, the, the answer is no, uh, yeah. there's no spread, yeah. It's a couple of questions now we've gotten about uh, biopsies potentially um, creating metastases. Um, Sharon, who had the chronic cough, did chime in uh, and say that she was diagnosed with dipneck. So you're correct in that. So Sharon, you should ask your physician about uh, getting treatment with somatostatin analogs. We published a couple of uh, papers already sharing our experience uh, with uh, improvement in about 80% of our patients um, under treatment with somatostatin analogs for coughing. Got it. Thank you. Uh, from Rita, can CT without contrast uh, chest and abdomen show nets? A CT without contrast may help to show or follow um, masses, uh, lumps in the lungs. In terms of the abdomen, is more problematic because usually we need contrast to see better uh, the uh, intra-abdominal organs um, as net can be missed easily uh, when you do a CT without contrast. Got it. Um, from our friend Ajid, uh, PRRT gives the body the max amount of radiation for a lifetime. So what do you do after PRRT in Israel? So, um, I mean, PRRT uh, um, conceptually, uh, we are planning four treatments at the time. Um, and then if the disease is responding well, meaning that uh, there is a response that persists more than at least one year after the ending of the initial uh, PRRT course, we can reconsider PRRT if the disease is progressive and still highly uptaking on the uh, gallium dotate fat CT, and there are no you know, renal failure or uh, suppression of the bone marrow with decrease in the blood count. So PRT, and then we can re-administer PRT. There are centers in the world that uh, are giving uh, seven, ten, and even more uh, courses. We in uh, in uh, Israel, um, we are um, deciding on a personal um, on, uh, on a personalized approach, uh, depending on the uh, age of the patient, the disease characteristics, the uptake, so on. But there is no limit practically if all, if the disease is uptaking well and uh, the dosimetry shows that there is no risk uh, for the kidneys and for the bone marrow. So it can be repeated. It is called salvage PRT. Got it. Thank you. And thanks for your question, Ajid. Um, Leslie says, what do you think about oral chemo for many METs to the liver? Uh, I believe that you are asking about CAPTEM because this is the only uh, oral chemo that I know for neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so it is a good possibility of treatment uh, for patients that have either a pancreatic primary or a lung primary with liver metastasis is usually not helpful and not useful for patients with um, an intestinal origin of the disease. Um, and usually it works for um, higher uh, grading tumors. I mean, it's uh, uh, used um, uh, usually uh, for K67 that are um, at least 10% and higher. So yes, it is a good option of treatment and it can help uh, for a long uh, a period of time with, um, um, uh, with not so many adverse effects and good quality of life. 
Got it. Uh, thanks, Leslie. Uh, interesting question from Nancy. Nancy says, several months after a six-month course of sandostatin, my hair has changed from straight to very curly. And a net specialist on this program told me that he thinks it is because I lost it, uh, uh, that he's, he's seen it caused before uh, by the drug. And I think I have a vague uh, recollection of that, Nancy, of that, uh, but I don't remember who the specialist was. Anyway, the question is, what Nancy wants to know, is this a permanent change? It's not really a problem, but it's strange to look in the mirror and see completely different hair. This is really a strange question and, <laughs> uh, and event, Nancy. Thank you for raising this. <laughs> Actually, I have hundreds and if many, many hundreds of patients uh, on somatostatin analogs. Um, personally, I have never seen changing from straight hair to curly hair under some of the analogs. I, I see from time to time hair loss, uh, mostly after PRT, uh, rarely after regular some of the analog, but I have <laughs> no experience with this. I have never seen a change in the consistency or appearance of the hair in terms of curly, curly hair and not straight. So um, you are yeah. a case report. You should, uh, your physician <laughs> should uh, report it because you know, it's first yeah. time uh, Definitely. I am hearing about this. Uh, and Nancy, if you could remember who that was, let us know. And this is also a good point about the community here within the show. If someone else can remember that question, because I have a vague memory of that. Or if someone else has experienced that, please share. Share it with Nancy. Let us know. I mean, this is really beneficial. I agree with Dr. Glassberg, too. Like, share it with your physician, but also share it with us and if you have experienced that. Um, da -da -da. Carol says, are the captions still working? Uh, yes, they are, but you it, that's on your end. There's that little CC button, so make sure that you're, you're, uh, you've hit that. You might have accidentally hit it off. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. Let's keep going. Um, Martin says, is it normal for net metastases to the bone to become painful over time? I am noticing increased discomfort in the past six months. This is a question. Uh, yeah, the question is, is it normal for net metastases to the bone to become painful? It's, uh, there is no, nothing that you can say normal for a bone metastasis. It can be painful, it cannot be painful. But if it's painful, you should uh, ask your net specialist because uh, you can receive external radiation therapy specifically to that metastasis palliated for pain. Uh, and it's, uh, it is really uh, very helpful usually. Um, and also, of course, um, uh, vitamin D and uh, calcium and maybe a specific treatment for uh, bone involvement such as bisphosphonate or uh, denosumab. But uh, for the pain, uh, please consider asking your net specialist regarding the radiation because it, it helps many times against the pain. And pain is not normal. It can happen, but it's not something and normal if it's happening or not. Sure, sure. Uh, Robin says, what does FDG uptake mean? FDG uh, is fluorodoxyglucose and usually is the PET CT that is used uh, mainly in the uh, oncology um, for um, um, disease or malignancy or cancers uh, that have a very high metabolic rate like breast cancer, like uh, the usual uh, lung cancer or uh, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, etc. Hmm. In neuroendocrine tumors, usually in most of them, uh, the uptake of FDG is low because the metabolic rate of these tumors is lower. However, we use FDG also in neuroendocrine tumors when uh, we have a tumor that is not uptaking, for example, uh, on gallium dotatate PET CT or the metastasis or different sites of the disease, uh, the uptake is heterogeneous. So it's very important to perform an FDG PET before um, deciding on the next treatment like PRT, so on. So usually, um, but I'm saying this carefully because I don't want to produce any distress uh, to, to who is asking. Usually um, um, diseases that are uptaking more on, PR, on FDG, uh, the meaning is that maybe the disease is more aggressive at that side of the disease. Got it. Thank you. From Heather, uh, my mother had the distal portion of her pancreas removed, nearly half of it, 
And her blood sugar is mostly stable with night, nightly insulin, but she seems to have hypo events, but you know, in the middle of the night between two and 5 a.m. Have you seen hypoglycemia in any of your patients? <clears throat> yes, yes, of course. I think that there is no one patient receiving insulin who is not getting at least once uh, hypoglycemia. And uh, I, I completely understand this is a very distressful event. Um, in patients that are um, um, elderly, for example, it is uh, preferable to have a, a little bit higher level of uh, glucose than to be very strict on you know, controlling the blood glucose because hypoglycemia is more dangerous than hyperglycemia in, mm -hmm. in older patients. And I think that uh, um, it should con be considered to, um, to have a late evening meal, a small meal just before going to sleep in order to prevent this episode. Sometimes even I'm asking my patients uh, to um, uh, wake up, for example, uh, once a night and have a very small meal just to prevent hypoglycemia if there is no other way of treatment, for example. But this should be discussed, uh, of course, with the... Uh, um, uh, med specialist and maybe Certainly. many times I'm helping myself even that I'm an endocrinologist but uh, I use the um, help of the, uh, the support of the diabetologist in our center to treat these complex situations. Got it. Thank you folks. We got a few more minutes. I'm gonna try to get to a couple more if we can. <clears throat> From Rita, if there is no receptor with the gallium scan but there are symptoms, can we start sandostatin? <clears throat> Yes, this is a very, very good uh, question. Um, on gallium dotated PET CT, we are usually um, evaluating the presence of somatostatin receptor 2. And maybe you know that uh, there are five uh, somatostatin receptors. Uh, and if there are symptoms that they are uh, related uh, to the disease, um, and uh, it can be considered, one can be considered to, to use somatostatin analog even. Um, if the somatostatin receptor 2 and the PET CT is negative, but this is um, relatively rare. I mean, uh, we can use, but uh, it's not very frequent. If we don't have any other possibility of treatment, so we, we, can, we are considering also somatostatin analog in these uh, situations. Got it. Thank you. Uh, from Ursula, I've had four times uh, sandostatin injections after six rounds of PRRT. The oncologist now stopped the injections as my liver functions were quite high that include my AST and ALT. I had my last round of PRRT in March. Should I worry or could this be from the nuclear treatment? It depends on the amount of the disease that you have uh, inside your liver. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, the response to the uh, PRT may include for a while increase, a temporary increase in, in your liver tests. Um, your, um, from my experience, um, uh, octreotide or somatolin, for example, can induce some stasis, biliary mm -hmm. stasis, and from time to time I can see some increase on alk or GGT just because of the called somatostatin analog um, and uh, um, some stasis or uh, in, in the bile duct inside the liver. Um, but it should very, be very closely follow up. Uh, from time to time, you are even stopping for a while the somatostatin analog and just uh, following the liver test. Dr. Glassberg, I, I often ask this question, and I know that you have a lot of different perspectives in which you view this disease. If someone were newly diagnosed last week and they're unsure of what this is, what it means, they're confused, they're scared, what's, what's your advice to that recently diagnosed patient? So the most uh, important thing, I think, is to find the right doctor for you. Um, I mean, um, uh, this field is uh, really, really very advanced. There are a lot of uh, options of treatment. The prognosis uh, of these tumors and the diseases is much better uh, because we have a lot of uh, um, um, options of treatment today. But um, I mean, you don't have to despair and you have to find the right person to treat you because there are many things to do. And uh, the most important is uh, to keep uh, 
a very good quality of life. And usually mm -hmm. with many of these uh, tumors, if they are um, properly treated, uh, people can live uh, uh, good lives uh, and for many, many years. So um, this is, I think, what I would say. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And folks, by the way, we just added the link to the ebook that we mentioned on nutrition uh, that we mentioned at the beginning, beginning of the program in the comments. So you can go find that. I definitely recommend you checking it out. Uh, Karen says, thank you, Dr. Glassberg. This is such an informative program. I agree with Karen. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and sharing your knowledge and experience, Dr. Glassberg. Rain, it was a great pleasure for me. And I, I'm feeling honored and humbled that I can oh. help at least for one hour answering people um, about these tumors. And I will be happy to come back to your show. And thank you again so much for inviting me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to take you up on that offer. Uh, and Sharon had asked um, uh, if, if you could send her um, information. This was the dip neck uh, case. But Sharon, if you just message us after the show, we'll make sure to put you uh, put you two in touch. Uh, but thanks to you all at home as well. We want to thank you. And we hope this program helped answer some of your questions. And I'll reiterate one more time. Please reach out to CCF at carsonoid.org, the website back here or here on the Facebook page if you have any other questions. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do the show. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I have been your host. Thank you for watching. And please join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.